Father. Well, we've been talking about what is good. What is good? God is good, right? What is really good? God is good. Can you say amen? And so we've been talking about how Jesus told a young man, uh, he called him good master, what my I do to inherit uh, eternal life. And God, Jesus told him quickly, I think he put a stop on him, says, who, who is good? No one, but one, which is God, right? And so that tells us how Jesus knows everything about our walk. Say with me, amen. amen. Everything about our walk, and it's not a bad thing, it's a good thing. Uh, it's not a co condemnation attitude, it's a, it's a really... A, Letting us know that there's things that the Holy Spirit shows us. I call it the cobwebs. Anybody ever remove cobwebs? I call it cobwebs that are here and there hanging around and you just can't figure out why they're always there. Well, get the source out. Get the, get the spider. Amen. And the thing about that is this is what the Holy Ghost does. Uh, he always, uh, always will always work on us. And I think it's a good thing. Say with me, amen. It's a good thing. Hallelujah. Amen. I want you to go with me to, uh, let's look at, first of all, we were in 2 Corinthians, the 8th chapter, and I stopped where Paul was speaking to the church about the offering. But we're going to continue, right? Just that, that. now notice this, in, verse, in 2 Corinthians, the 8th chapter, hallelujah. Notice what it says in verse 11. We read earlier up to verse 10, right? But now we're going to continue verse 11. Well, let's read verse 10 so we can see it clearer, right? It says this, And herein I give my advice. Say with me, advice. For this is expedient for you who have begun before not only to do but also to be forward a year ago. He, he's saying this, what you said you're going to do, do it. So let me just do it, right? Now notice this. It says here, verse 11, Now, therefore, perform the doing of it. There it is again. The doing of it, which is, we're talking about the giving. Perform the doing of it. That is, there was a readiness to will, so there may be a performance. I want you to underline readiness to will so there may be a performance. Readiness to will so there may be a performance also out of that which you have. Now notice this, willingness to take performance. I want you to think about that. Now notice this, I don't want you to think about the word perform on a stage, but I want you to think about acting upon what you're willing to do. Has anybody ever had a desire to do something and never accomplished it, right? I mean, it's easy to talk about it and say you're going to do it, but then the, the rubber meets the road and that's where it's at, right? All of us go through that. Have you ever had a willingness to do something but never gave it the performance it needs? Now, this is faith at work here. This is faith at work here. And I believe this is what the Lord is teaching us through Paul. What you're having a willingness, go for it. First of all, if it lines up with the word of God, like for instance, tithing. Well, I have a willingness to tithe, but I just don't have the effort to do it. I believe you need to have more of a profound understanding of tithing to be able to have the performance of willing. But that's not my, that's not my message. It's just the point that I'm making. The Bible says, you don't need to turn there, in Psalms 37, 4, Delight yourself in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. This is part of willingness. This is part of willingness. Hallelujah. Amen. In other words, moving into that realm. Hallelujah. Amen. Can we get the page? Hallelujah. There's more of a willingness. Uh, go, ahead and, go ahead and take the children downstairs. Hallelujah. Oh, okay. Hallelujah. Amen. Now notice this. Uh, so in other words, praise God, there has to be a willingness to do these things. Can you say amen? 
Now notice what it says here, according to that particular verse in, uh, in chapter 8, that in the Amplified. Hallelujah. Amen. So now finish doing it that your enthusiastic readiness is desiring it may be equaled by your completion of it according to your ability and means. That's the Amplified. That's the Amplified. In other words, doing it, having an, 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 a readiness, an enthusiasm in doing it. Now, we're talking about who is good. No one is good but God, right? So we're looking at something so important here. The world has a way of doing things that are good to them, that are not good to the church. But yet the church, not knowing the good that they're saying, apart from the word, are calling it also good. Now, this is what Paul is saying. When the Holy Spirit leads you by the word, he gives you a desire. He gives you a willingness. Now, our job is to perform it, to move in that direction. Like the, like the Macedonians, they had a willingness to give. But notice this, perform it now. Not like you did a year ago that you talked about it, do it now. And this is so good, so neat for us to understand this because all of us have desires and have, we have a willing heart, but I think the problem lies in doing it. A willingness to do it, right? Come on, church, hallelujah, amen. I think all of us have that issue. You know, we want to you know, do something, but there's not that unction or that power to get it accomplished. I want you to think about that. What in your life that you have a desire to do and you realize that you press through to do it and it worked? All of us. But how many of us have had a desire and we don't do anything about it and then we regret it and say, God, I should have did it. Now, wasn't it so simple to move into that direction of willingness to, to, to do it? Come on, church. Hallelujah. Amen. So one thing is this. One thing is to desire and another thing is to actually do it. I was talking to Pastor Christine when how we met. We walked down memory lane yesterday. Really, it was part of the sermon that I, I was focusing on. And I remember as a musician, we were playing in a, a convention in Kennedy, Texas. Um, you probably never heard of it, but it's a little country town, little dust town, Kennedy, Texas. And um, she came to that concert, invited by her brother-in-law, which was part of our team band. And her mother and her drove, I'm talking about hours driving to get there. And that was the day that she saw me and I saw her. I didn't move on it because, you know, I, I was focused on the service. But I did notice that there was somebody that was standing out among the crowd that you could see your eyes got on it quicker, right? But you could tell. Then about a week later, we came to Houston to play in a church. We were playing in another a service and... I was setting up my equipment, and uh, I was on the stage setting up my equipment, and all of a sudden, uh, this beautiful lady came to me, a young girl, said, do you want me to turn on the ceiling, or the fan? And I said, yep, yeah, yes, please. That was the same girl that I saw in Kennedy. And I said, this country girl don't follow me all the way to the big city. But didn't realize that was her home church. And so the desire was to meet her, her desire was to meet me. In fact, she told me when I first saw you, I really wanted to meet you, but I thought you were just, uh, you were, what was the word you said? Uh, I was not capable of knowing you, you know, in that sense. Because, you know, you're a band member, you think you get to see all kinds of people, all kinds of girls. It's not like that, right? To, for me, right? I, I love music and that was it, right? But the thing about that was there was a desire. So the desire had to be, I had to step out in faith and invite her the next day out for a pizza. And we went and ordered a big pizza, and I kid you not, we didn't eat a piece of pizza at all. We left it. Now, who in their right mind will leave a pizza? Well, when you're first dating and first getting to know each other, you're nervous. You're not going to eat. Can you imagine getting pizza and just stretching out that cheese? And then she was wearing braces, so I could imagine her. She probably was all fear, scared about, you know, having all kinds of cheese on her, right? But I want you to think about this. There was a willingness. There was a willingness, a desire to move in that direction. Can you say amen? I want you to see something. Go with me to the book of Mark. So 
there has to be a willingness to perform. There has to be a desire to actually do something. Amen. Hallelujah. Now notice what Jesus said in Mark the 8th chapter. Hallelujah. Mark the 8th chapter. Verse 34. The Bible says in Mark 8, 34, and I want you to see this. Praise God. Are you there? And when he had called the people unto him with his disciples, also he said unto them, now notice this, whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Remember we talked about it Wednesday and then Sunday. Now notice this. Let him deny himself, take up his own cross, and follow me. Verse 35. For whoever will save his life shall lose it, but whoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospel, the same shall save it. Now notice this. He's not talking about just losing your life altogether, but he's talking about going after him. And I think this is where... People look at the goodness of God in a different way. Well, I get saved, and it's my life, and I can do what I want with my life. No, it's not right. Come on, church. Notice this. When you lose your life to Christ, that was the desire you had. I remember the day that I gave my life to Jesus. That was the desire I had. I had a willing heart to raise my hand and say, Jesus, come into my heart. Please forgive me. Uh, I believe that you're the son of God. I receive forgiveness in Jesus' name. I had a desire. I had a willingness. But now I had to be a performance in my life. I had to move into that arena of accepting. Remember, we all got saved, but the next step is making him Lord of your life, meaning possessor, authority, owner of everything you are, giving your whole life to him. And that's where the problem lies today. People have received salvation but have never made Jesus the Lord. See, one is saved, but never allowed God to become their Lord. And I think that's what's happening here. Jesus is saying here, when when you make a covenant with the most wonderful person in the universe, think about this, you have to give yourself fully to him, fully to him. Think about it, fully. I, I am married, and we've been married, what, 50 How many years? 46. Golly, I always said 50-something. 46 years, right? Notice this. I gave my life, my whole being to her, right? And that's what happens in your Christian walk. You give God your life. Can you say amen? So in other words, when you desire to lose your life, it just isn't enough. You have to have now a performance Remember, not an actress performance or an actor performance, but now to perform what God has called you to do. Move into that arena. And this is what the world calls, this is the good way of living. This is the good life of living. And this is the way. Listen, folks, there are things that we have to understand something. If it is not the Word of God, if it has nothing to do with the Word of God, then understand something. It's not the goodness of God. Come on, church. It's one of the easy things to understand. When I'm studying the Word of God, and I find out that the Lord is trying to teach me something in the Word of God, and then my neighbors or my friends or my families are totally opposite of that Word, or totally against that Word, or totally performing different from that Word, then I have to recognize something is not good there. This is good for me. Hallelujah. Amen. But it's not only to understand that we have to make the performance of it. We have to move into that arena to accept it, to believe it, to walk through it. Hallelujah. Amen. See, you made a covenant with God when you said, Jesus, I repent. Come into my heart. I need you. Please forgive me of all my sins. I believe you're the son of God. What are you doing? You're making a covenant with the most powerful, most beautiful being in the whole universe. And that's a covenant. Now, the covenant now is a continuation of your walk with God. In other words, it's not a one saved situation. It's about every day 
moving into that realm to become more like Jesus. And the Bible says, working out your salvation. In other words, day, day by day, I'm working to be closer to God. I'm working to fulfill the covenant that I made with God. I'm working. Because what happens to us when we move into that arena of working with him, we open ourselves up for more revelation of knowing how to get rid of cobwebs in our life. How to get rid of things in our life. Come on, church, you know what I'm talking about? Uh, there are Christians, there was a war movie that I wanted to see so bad. So I asked a member at that time of our church, and, and they said, Pastor, it's a good movie, you need to go see it. I said, let me ask you a question. Is it safe for me? I mean, uh, I mean, does it have any curse word? And this person said, no, Pastor. I mean, it is literally a good movie. So you know what Pastor Christine and I did? We went to the movies. And we sat down, and I got up in the middle of that movie and said, I'm getting out of here. Lord, forgive me. Man, there was curse words coming out like left and right. Any war movie that you're going to see modern, you're going to have all kinds of curse words, right? So you stay away from war movies. Now I go to black and white war movies. Amen. That's different, right? But I understand something. I came home a little disturbed. I, I said, now, I don't understand that. Why did he say it's a clean movie? Why did they say it's, it's okay, Pastor? They were already exempt from that condition of being warned and being convicted of curse words. If they went that far, then that tells me something. They were not in the right attitude of performing the, the scripture that says, work out your salvation. Amen. And then to tell your pastor that, I was like, I told him the next day, I said, you know what, you've got to repent, brother. That movie had, I mean, just me sitting for the few minutes had all about six F's. I mean, the first one, I was ready to get up and go, but I said, okay, wait a minute, what's going on here, right? I want you to think about it. You make a relationship with, with God. You make a covenant with God. Go with me to Ephesians now. Ephesians, the fifth chapter. We're going to go through a lot of scriptures today, so hang in there. We're looking at some things about what is good. Remember, uh, they said it's a good movie. God said, there's no one good except God. Come on, church. No one good except God. Can you say amen? Ephesians, the fifth chapter. Verses 31, the Bible says this here in verses 31. I want you to see this now. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery. Say, I mean, this is a great mystery. <laughs> Everybody say, this is a great mystery. It is a great mystery. But listen to what he says, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. He says there is a mystery when uh, people come together and be married, they become one. That is a mystery, and there's so much there. It is really there, powerful. It's a powerful thing there. But he's talking about the church. Say with me, the church. church. Notice this, interestingly, interestingly, Paul is using this scripture to compare your relationship with God as your marriage, as your marriage. Now notice this, it's a relationship with God. You're married to God. Amen, church. You're married to God. This is totally a, illustrates the relationship that you made with Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. When I gave my life to Jesus, it, it, it was it. That's it. That's it. There is no going back. There is no cheating on God. There is no turning. I'm going all the way with God, all the way. In fact, to this day, I still confess, for me, for me and my house, we shall serve the Lord all the days of my life. And you should confess that too every day, all of us, all of us. We have so many people that we need to pray for. I have brothers and sisters that I need to keep praying for. Hallelujah. Amen. So in other words, when I read this, Paul is saying, just like you have, just like there's a mystery with married people, but I'm really speaking about the church and Christ. I think we need to really swallow this and say, God, if you're conferring that marriage is so important, like the churches to Christ, and I need to really open my eyes to see something here. And I'm speaking, I'm speaking to, to us to encourage us that we just don't come to church just to fulfill a schedule uh, or say, I went to church, at least I feel better. No, it's part of your covenant. 
to be fulfilled with God. Hallelujah. Amen. You see what I'm saying? Uh, uh, David said, I I'd rather be in the, uh, a doorkeeper in the house of God than to be among the tent of the wicked. Have you ever thought about that? Have you ever desired to be in God just about every day, in the church of God every day? I told Pastor Christine, boy, I, I just enjoy the church. We came a couple, you came, I think, the day that you cut the grass Friday. Bless you for cutting the grass on that heat day. But he waited till evening, but still it was hot. And I came to see the internet. But, uh, but uh, we came in the church building, and you could feel such an anointing, a peace of God. Pastor Christine, I says, you feel that strong anointing in this house? I said, I love it. Oh, this is beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Why? It's because we've come with one intention, is to worship the Lord. We've come with one intention, is to leave the world outside and to come in to worship together as a family. We're married to Jesus. This is the time. And really, I think we limit God with our relationship, just going to him on Wednesdays and Sundays, if that's all you do. If that's all your reading is on Wednesdays and Sundays, and I want to encourage you to move higher with that. I mean, every day you ought to get up and spend time with, with the lover of your life. Hallelujah. Amen. Every day, uh, worship him, honor him. Always recognize him and all the beauty that's around you. Hallelujah. Amen. Come on, church. Hallelujah. Amen. Uh, this morning we sang some beautiful songs. That was worship time unto him. Giving him all the worship. Hallelujah. Amen. Now notice, let me read to you from the Ephesians, the, the same that, scripture that I read in the Amplified. This mystery is very great. But I speak concerning the relationship of Christ and the church. So, I mean, mystery is very great. It's very great when you think about it. So, if the mystery is very great, then I believe we need to know this mystery that he has for us from the beginning of ages. How to know him more. And we're, we're living on this side of the cross, hallelujah. We're, we're not living on the other side of the cross. We're not living in the days of the prophets, in the days of... Of, of where there was no instruction uh, of, of grace. It was all law, 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 and you couldn't live it. You couldn't live the law. You couldn't live it, and you were so down discouraged because you couldn't live the law. But then Jesus Christ and did away with the law, uh, did away with the, that principles that are affecting the people from coming to him. He brought in grace. So I'm on this side of the cross, honoring God, hallelujah, amen, asking God to forgive us all the time, hi, amen. We ought to ask God always to forgive us. Father, forgive us, forgive us. Father, for me thinking this way, talking that way, imagining watching this or whatever it may be, forgive me, forgive me, forgive me, hallelujah, amen. So there is a mystery in knowing God, and it is a mystery that is so good. Can you say amen, church, amen. Tell me, hallelujah, hallelujah. God is good, hallelujah, amen. Tur turn to your neighbor, he's a good God. Look at James, the fourth chapter. Now, Pastor, what, what literally breaks our relationship with God? Let's look at the Word of God. What really breaks our relationship, which is our marriage to the Lord? What really breaks it? Look at James 4, and this is so awesome. Now, notice this. It's very strong. Remember, it's like the church, right? I mean, it's like marriage. Come on, church, it's like marriage. And notice this. I'm going to read something in, in, in 4, 4, but it's so strong, but I want you to see this. You adulterers, I underline that, and adulteresses, know ye not that friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whoever, therefore, will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Now, stop here for a moment. Think about it real quickly. Why does this, call, why does this say adulterers and adulteress? Because there is a marriage that has been affected. There is a covenant that's been affected. And so, in the natural, whenever there is a covenant of marriage that's been affected by maybe whatever it could be, it's a sign of division it's a sign of severance, but also it could be a sign that there was adultery. Come on, church, you see what I'm saying? Now, this is a very serious sign, a, a very serious situation. Come on, church. And, and if you study this, uh, we find that adultery to the word or to, the, to Moses and God was totally powerful. I mean, it, was, it was like it was a death sentence. But then when Jesus came, he said, it's still strong but God can heal it. I have a, 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 a relative that was divorced for 15 years, a very hard divorce, and 
it was an adulterous situation. And uh, she gave her life to Jesus. And uh, the Lord put in her heart to forgive her ex-husband. And the Lord put on his heart to, uh, to ask her for forgiveness. And when they met to forgive each other, uh, there was a spark in their lives again. And they, they were very careful with each other, but God brought them back together after 15 years. And, and uh, of course, he went on, passed away, on, uh, and went to be with the Lord, but she still lives. But the testimony that I see in this is there has to be a strong forgiveness. Uh, there's a trust relation that was broken. It had to be something strong that only the Holy Ghost can do. Only the Holy Ghost can do. Now, notice this. Only the Holy Ghost can do in this situation, and I feel for that. But here, Jesus, or, or James, the, the apostle, says something. He says, it's almost like you separated from God. And he uses a strong word here. Now, notice what it says in the Good News Translation. So, I try to find something more pleasant for us to read, but, but nevertheless, it's still powerful. Genesis, in the Good News Translation, the same scripture, it says, unfaithful people. Now, notice it says, unfaithful people. Don't you know that to be the world's friend means to be God's enemy? That's powerful, right? If you want to be world's, if you want to be the world's friend, you make yourself God's enemy. Now, when I saw that, I realized something. That's why the church of Jesus Christ needs to know that God is good. Say with me, he's a good God. That's why he pulls us from the world. Because there's a covenant that you and I made with him when we received him as Savior. Uh, we, he saved me from sin. I made him Lord of my life. I got married to him. I became connected to him. There's a covenant that I made with him that I will not break. Nothing will separate me. Paul says, what shall separate me, separate me from the love of God? And he talked about, will it, will it be this or this or this or this? Nothing shall separate me from the love of God. Say with me, nothing shall separate me from the love of God. Say it again, nothing shall separate me from the love of God. I mean, nothing, nothing, nothing shall separate you. So when we go to the world and knowing that we confessed Jesus, we're playing with the world and we're playing with the marriage unto Christ. And so now we become adulterous, adulterers. You see what I'm saying? We become unfaithful to him. I tell you, when I read that, it, it literally shook my bones because I realized how many people play the world and the church. But I'm going to tell you what we found out in Scripture, why that happens. Amen. Notice what it says in that same verse in the Message Bible. It brings it, brings it out stronger. So it would be, amen. amen. You want to hear it? Does everybody want to hear it? Yeah. This is really strong. It's the message Bible, which should be the easiest one to understand. He said, you're cheating on God. You're cheating on God. If all you want is your own way, flirting with the world every chance you get, you end up enemies of God and his ways. And do you suppose God doesn't care? I read that. I said, do you suppose God doesn't care? That's where grace comes in. He loves you. You can turn, people can turn their back on God, but he still is there for you. He still wants you. Hallelujah. Amen. You can run from God like the, the psalmist says, but I'm in the mountain. You can go to the deepest sea, but I'm in the sea. You can go to the lowest valley, but I'm in the lowest valley. Think about that. You can't run anywhere. With God. God's everywhere. Amen. Amen. But he loves you. Hallelujah. Amen. You can turn yourself to him. Hallelujah. Amen. Anytime. Amen. So this is the key that, that, that I see here, and we've got to notice it first in Mark, the 10th chapter. Why is it, Pastor, this happens? I think the sharpness of not knowing the word of God allows people to fall in the sea. See, again, many get saved. Now, you ready for this? Many get saved because it has benefits. Have you ever heard somebody says, man, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to serve Jesus because I really need a bigger house. I'm sure nobody said it here. We're going to serve Jesus. I'm going to serve Jesus because I need to make more money. I'm going to serve Jesus because, like my neighbor said, serving Jesus, you become prosperous. Well, let's put it this way. Yes, by serving Jesus you do, but that's not the reason why you come to Jesus. You come to Jesus because you need salvation. 
Come on, you need, to, you need to take you out of the devil's hell. Hallelujah, amen. Now, notice this. Look at Mark, the 10th chapter. Are you getting this, church? Hallelujah, amen. So we're talking about what is really good. So, I mean, God is good. Uh, the world says this is good and this is good. Oh, God, come on, church. This is not, the world's way is not good. Come on, church. The world's way is not good. So I'm separating from the world's way. That's why the world is such a mess. But I'm getting in the word the world's way instead of the world's way. Amen. Mark the 10th chapter, verses 17. I want you to see this. Now, we, this, is, this is the scripture that we read, but we're going to go deeper. So we meet deeper. Now, notice this. Now, I want you to, to study the Ten Commandments in Exodus. I want you to study them. Now, the reason why they're in order is because they bring out very powerful principles in order. The number one, the first one is thou shall not serve other gods. That's the first one. Amen. So in other words, from there it moves to everything else. But let's look at something. I, I, let's learn something here what Jesus knew that we wouldn't have had revelation unless by the Holy Ghost taught us. Notice what it says in, in, in verses 17 of chapter 10. Are you there? Hallelujah. This is, this is, and when he was gone forth into the way, there came one running. Why was he running to Jesus? That's very important. And kneeled to him and asked him, good master, what shall I do that I may inherit salvation or inherit eternal life? Running to him means there's the master. I need to connect with him because I know that he's going to bless me. Come on, church. So in other words, he was looking at Jesus blessing me. Now notice this, and Jesus said unto him, why callest thou me good? There is none good but one that is God. Remember, we read that earlier. And then Jesus said, thou knowest the commandments. Do not kill. Now notice this, that was number seven. Do, oh, excuse me, do not commit adultery. That was number seven. Do not kill. That was number six, or excuse me, eight. Do not steal, that was number, uh, hold on just a minute, my, 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 my pen's all scratchy. That was number uh, eight, excuse me. Do not bear false witness, that's number nine. Do not, uh, defraud not. Honor thy father and mother, that's number five. In other words, it's amazing how he's going back and forth in this. And let's look at something. And he answered and said unto Master, all these I have observed from my youth. Then Jesus, behold him, loved him and said unto him, one thing thou lackest. Now notice this, one thing thou lackest. Go thy will and sell whatever thou hast and give to the poor and thou shalt have treasure in heaven and come take up the cross and follow me. Now notice this, it's amazing. Jesus mentioned the six commandments which deal with human relationship. All right, human relationship. Say with me, human relationship. The four others that he did not mention were very important is man's relationship with God. And that's where he missed it. Man's relationship with God. Come on, church, amen. So if you study this, you're going to find something. He said, you don't know the relationship that you should have with God, but you follow all these other ones. Now notice this, I bring it to the 21st century now. I bring it to us now. How many don't know the relationship with God versus what God can do for them? Amen. Think about that for a moment. That's powerful. Think about that. Uh, I'm not against a prosperity message, and I'm not against uh, being prosperous, but I'm against when you start elevating the prosperity message first after salvation. First of all, let's get you right with Jesus first. Make him the Lord of your life. Everything that you are to God, you are to God. You're married to him. Don't worry about the prosperity. Don't worry about anything else yet. Worry about, first of all, let's work on this first. And then as you mature in the Lord, you start seeing the benefits of have, making him the Lord of your life. Do, do we understand that? 
benefits of that. Think about how many Christians today are in church not knowing the relationship with God, but only knowing the benefits. You see what I'm saying? There are a lot of people that only know the benefits. And you can spot them a mile away. You can hear them, how they talk, how they pray. But you can sure spot a person that loves the Lord with all their heart. Come on, church. I think about uh, people that love God with all their heart. And, and man, you could just see God just coming out of them in every area. Oh, forget prosperity. That's, yeah, they're prosperous, but that's not the point. The point is they're just, it's just like the oil of God just coming out of people. You, you know people like that? It's amazing. You love them. You, you can sense God. You can feel God. It's the anointing of God. Besides the prosperity, that's not even what you're thinking about right at that, that moment. You're thinking the presence of God is all over this person's life. But how many of us go after, and I say us, there is a people out there that are going after prosperity messages rather than making God the Lord of his life. Amen. Can you say amen? Hallelujah. Let's look at that word idol. Let's look at that word idol. Now, what happened here, Jesus knew this man had an idol. Tell me amen. He had an idol. Now, I want you to see this. Let's look at the definition of an idol. Idol is a person or thing that is greatly admired or loved or revered. Rever, uh, rever. uh, like, for instance, let's say a basketball idol, a football idol, a car racing idol, and a horse racing idol, a horse racing idol. It could be anything, anything, anything. My definition of idol is something that stands between you and God. What's standing between you and God? And what's allowing that perform more than God perform in your life? That's, that's my definition. My definition is something that you, pers- you put first before God. Now, I-, I want you to think about it. What do I put before God? Are you getting this, church? Amen. How y'all getting really quiet? What, what are you putting before God? Hallelujah. Something you desire more than God. Come on, church, something you desire more than God. Now, I want you to think about that for a moment. Anything can be an idol. Anything about anything that comes between you and God. Anything, anything, anything. When God is telling you something and you put something in between him, that's an idol automatically. How do you deal with something like that? You push the idol away and you move into the presence of God. You move into the obedience of God. And that shows you that idol is, can't be an idol in my life. Come on, church, hallelujah, amen. Notice what it says in Mark, the 10, oh, you're there, right? Go in verses 22 now, verses 22. Let's go further on that story that we read, which we didn't yet, but let's go further. And he, he was sad, this young boy was sad at the saying of Jesus, and he, wait, and he went away grieved, for he had great possession. Look at that word sad. That word sad, he was depressed and grieved in what Jesus said. This man was so eager to come to Jesus, but walked away full of sorrow. I want you to think about it. You remember the day that you were so eager to come to Jesus? The day that you gave, I want all of you to think about the day that you gave your life to Jesus. What a tremendous day that was. Your life changed. You felt it. You sensed it. But then the growing time happened. You felt like, well, God, are you still there? He's there. It's just that you're growing. The word, you're growing. And the more you find out there's more pressing through, there's more pressing through, but yet you know you're saved. And you know without a shadow of doubt, if you die, you're going to go to be with the Lord. But there's still a pressing. There's still a pressing. Why is that happening? It's growth. It's actually growth. And what happens to many, they give up on the growth. They say, oh, it's too hard being a Christian. I can't go forward anymore. I'm exhausted. I can't do it. No, no, no. You keep pressing because that's what this man came to Jesus, the easy way. But he walked away because Jesus said, give up your possessions first. Jesus wasn't calling him to become poor. He was saying, give up your idol, which is your riches. And come follow me. Now, the word follow me, if you ever study that, Every time Jesus used the word follow me meant come be my disciple. Every disciple that you read in Mark, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and Jesus said come follow me. He said be my disciple. Now notice this. Today he says come follow me. What does that mean? You follow him. You become a disciple. What does the word disciple mean? Everybody know what that word disciple means? A disciplined one. I tell you folks, Christianity isn't for lazy people. Because the enemy is lazy. The enemy wants laziness, right? But I tell you what, there's something about pressing through when 
When there's a storm in your life, you press through. When there's situations in your life, you press through. How many people remember going through storms uh, being a Christian? You press through. I, I, you know, I can remember storms in my life, in Pastor Christine's life, and in your life. What do you do? You keep pressing through. This boy was so eager to come to Jesus because he knew he wanted the blessing this man offered, but he walked away full of sorrow. Folks, we have to build our life on the foundation of Jesus. That's real stuff, not temporary stuff. Come on, church. Amen. Not temporary stuff. Folks, there are things that come in our walk that can really shake us, but they're not going to knock us down. In fact, if it does knock me down, the Bible says, get up and stand up. Can you say amen? We press through. We're like soldiers. Amen. We have our boots of war on. We press through in these days. Hallelujah. Amen. What's going on in this world shouldn't make you depressed, make you worried and fearful. You should say, Father, I look up because you're coming. You're coming, Lord. The darker it gets here, the brighter it's. I'm getting and you're coming. I'm getting closer to you. Amen. What happened yesterday at this campaign rally was a shock to many people. But what do we do? We just keep moving forward with God and saying, God, you're still on the throne. You're on the throne, God. You're working in us, God. The church is not dead in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Can you say amen? amen? Go with me to verses 23 now. Hallelujah. Amen. Now notice this. This is where probably some of us would be. And the disciples were astonished at his words. Let's find out why they were astonished. Verses 24, are you there? Uh, they were, <laughs> hallelujah, amen. They were astonished at his, at his words. Uh, but Jesus answered the good and said unto them, Children, how hard is it for them that trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of God? It's not hard. Remember, the kingdom of God is not a location, it's a way of living. The kingdom of heaven is a location, but he's talking about a way of living. He says, how hard is it for you to enter the kingdom of God? Remember, seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. Come on, church, can you say amen, hallelujah? Now notice this, go all the way down to verse 28. Let's look at Peter. Peter, the one that always was kind of a tough cookie, right? I mean, some say he put his foot in his mouth. I think he really stepped out here. <laughs> Peter began to say to him, Lo, that word is really disrespectful. Lo, we have left all and have followed thee. <laughs> What's he doing? He's having a protest here. He's really protesting. And he's questioning what Jesus just said. He blurted out. How many people have ever blurted out something that should have been the word instead of blurting out, you blurt out the problem? Come on, it's so easy to blurt out the problem, but it's so good to blur out the word. And how many people have ever caught themselves? Oh, <laughs> Lord, please forgive me. Oh, that shouldn't have happened. He said, low, low. You know what low is like today? Are you for real? Are you real? We left everything to follow you. Oh, Jesus. And let's keep reading. And Jesus answered and said uh, to Peter, and then he's teaching us, Truly, truly, or verily I say unto you, there is no man that had left house or brother or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my sake and the gospel's sake. But he shall receive, now notice this, verse 30, he shall receive a hundredfold now, in this time, houses, brothers, sisters, mothers, children's land with persecutions and in the, this world uh, to come eternal life and the world to come eternal life. I tell you what, that's a good promise to lay a hold of. But he said persecutions. Come on, church. Do you notice Jesus never enticed them? Them disciples will follow him with money. You never see Jesus talk about money, enticing them to come follow me and you'll be rich. You never said that. He said, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. So in other words, he's saying, you follow me and you're going to get active in what I'm going to do. But how many of us follow, now I say us for the purpose of understanding the church as a whole. How many of us follow after the riches and not wanting to make disciples of Christ. Now that's strong, folks. I'm telling you, that's strong. Hallelujah, man. Have you ever noticed that? Have you ever noticed that? He said, 
he said here, follow me, not follow me for what I can do to you. There's times I catch myself and I say, Father, I ask you to forgive me. I come to you to worship you and honor you. And Lord, you know all things that I need. So Lord, I don't put that first before you. There's times that I catch myself. Uh, one person said he never asked God for anything. All he does is ask God to, I worship you and I love you and I praise you. And God meets his desires. I want you to think about that. Isn't that a close relationship knowing that if you just put love on God first, then he just loves you back and he knows what you need. Of. You know, God knows everything that we go through, what we need in life. Hallelujah. Amen. There's principles in the word of God that we stand on. Hallelujah. But we don't make God, uh, if I can say it this way, a sugar daddy. You know what I'm talking about? Come on, church. Can you say amen? You know what I'm talking about? And I want you to see this. It's about worshiping. It's about honoring him. Come on, church. It's about honoring him. I have no people in ministry. Uh, people that have come to this church coming for the purpose of wanting things. Wanting things. And you know that. We would help anybody unless the Lord says not to. Uh, there was a man that came to this church, and uh, I think he asked Damala that he needed some help financially. And Damala already knows that we don't do stuff like that unless the Lord does something. And, and he, the, Damala said, you know what, why don't you come to church and sit in, and maybe the Lord would say, do something. And he didn't, he left. Didn't want to come to church. So that tells me he was seeking silver and gold rather than the gold giver. Come on, church. You see what I'm and, there, and there are people that have, he, he has told to sit, and they sit, and during the sermon as I'm preaching, I feel a pull, and then we'll pick up an offering for that person. Oh, what a wonderful time to pick up an offering for the one that comes to the church and asks for help, and then he sits, or they sit throughout the whole time. Oh, it's so beautiful to love them, pray for them, and they walk away and say, Jesus, thank you, thank you, thank you. It's not my business to know what they're going to do with it, but it's my business to follow the Holy Spirit and teach us how to give. Hallelujah. Amen. See, you don't give to anybody they ask. Come on, church. We were at Waterburg one day at the church, and, and we both sensed to buy this homeless man a burger. He never asked for a burger. In fact, he went in there with a cup, and I watched him, and he didn't get a Coke. He had an old Waterburger cup, so I thought he was going to abuse the system and get a Coke. He got ice and water. I saw him, and I said, wow integrity in that homeless man. And he's walking out the door, and I said, come here. I said, come here. I, said, I call him son, so he's, I'm old enough to tell him, son, son, are you hungry? You want a hamburger? He says, oh, yeah. I said, what kind of hamburger? He said, uh, whatever you want to give me. No, no, what do you want? Do you want cheese on yours? I took him to the front, and I don't care who was watching. I said, what do you want, cheese? What else you want? Okay, give him. It's amazing how he went to the back. Uh, we're sitting toward the back. He went and came to me, and and, and I asked him what his name was. And he asked me what my name. I told him I'm Pastor Robert. He did this. And he went, oh, thank you. <laughs> I said, you don't have to do that. You don't have to do that. But, but uh, go enjoy your hamburger. What that did to him and what that did to us and what that did to other people that were convicted or feeling to do something to help that young man. Now, the Bible says you have to remember there are angels that are sent unassigned. So an angel, can, that could have been an angel. But see, we have to follow the leader of the Holy Spirit, not our flesh. Come on, church, hallelujah, amen. So we have to recognize, and notice this, disciples let, left everything to follow Jesus. This is true, they left everything. They really did, left everything. Amen. Why should it be any different for you and me to leave everything to follow Jesus? You know, you, you've, you've killed yourself already to Jesus. You've, you're crucified to him. The world's crucified to you. I think we need to have the attitude of God, it's about you in my life. It's about you. Are you getting this, church? Holly? It's about you, God, in my life. Amen? So this is, if I said everything to say this, the root reason why some fall in their spiritual walk I'm going back to not making Jesus the strong, sure foundation in their walk. I want you to look at me, everybody here. Make Jesus the most powerful foundation in your walk. If you find that your foundation is not strong, work on that first. Work on that first. And then build upon that strong foundation so when the floods come, the storms come, the winds come. It's not going to fall. Remember I said Wednesday? There were both pe two people that built 
upon two different foundations, same building material. Can I say it this way? They worshiped together in church. They had the same shout. They had the same victory. They gave the same. They, they tied. But when the storms came out of those two, one was standing and the other one fell. Now, when one falls, we don't rush to hurt them. We help them build their foundation. Amen. So when the foundation is not strong, I mean, listen, folks, I mean, you know. Let's say all of us are given an assignment to go build a beautiful tiny home. And you're given a plot of land. You're given maybe three quarters of an acre right behind a river, right by a river, and, it, and they gave it to you. And they say, now, we have money allotted for you to build a tiny home. But you got to build it. What do you do first, folks? Find out how much I have. But also, you start studying how to build it right. You're not going to build it close to that, that river because you don't know the river's crest time. So you're going to study things. You're going to study the river. You're going to study there's a dam on this other river. You're going to study the flood zone. You're going to study, you're going to study, you're going to study. And then comes the building. How are we going to build it? Piers, cement, foundation. What are we going to do? How are we going to do it? See, you're focusing more on the preparation to build it versus jumping on a bunch of logs <laughs> and building it. Come on, church. Amen. And then you find out, like I said, Wednesday, we put our tent by the ocean and we didn't realize high tide came and all that. Our tent started washing. We were running around. I'll never forget that. Didn't know the ocean had high tide. I, I heard high tide, but I know what that meant. Well, I know what it means now. See, that's what we do. Amen. I want to add this. Let's don't let the message be marketable. This is what I'm going to say. But let it be an accurate scriptural message to your life. Not marketable. Amen. Not motivational. The message is powerful and it motivates you in faith. But you're not here to be motivated just to enjoy the way the world is. We're here to set ourselves apart from the world. Can you say amen? We're here to set apart from the world. And we're here to find uh, by the Holy Ghost what the Holy Ghost will show you that there's cobwebs in certain areas. All of us have cobwebs we have to get to. All of us. Come on, church. Amen. <laughs> Amen. I talked about, you know, chocolate and all that good stuff, right? For me, personally. I put a test to my body. You're not having chocolate today. <laughs> Amen. There's simple things that we can do, right? But what, what, what am I saying? Is there's things in your life we need to work on, right? Hallelujah. Let's turn this Bible into a biblical message instead of a good message the world is swallowing up and are in sad conditions. Amen. Folks, I'm going to close my Bible so I want you to realize that I'm finished, but, but I, I want to tell you, I told you a couple of weeks ago to pray for pastors. Remember I told you that? Pray. I, I was saying it by the Holy Ghost. And I was talking about pray for pastors and pray for issues and things are happening. But I got attacked very strong, very strong, got attacked very strong. That literally, um, if it wasn't for the word, it would have buckled my knees. Right? But I knew the Lord reminded me. He said, you said pray for pastors. So you're a pastor. So I started praying for my office. I started praying for my office. Not me as a person, but in my office, praying as an office. And the more that I prayed, the more I started realizing the attack that is upon um, the Word of God. I, you know, look, think about it. Right now, I don't know how many scriptures did y'all get today? Yeah, you know, a lot of them, right? And if you notice how the Lord had you going through some deep stuff, what's the Holy Spirit saying now? The Holy Spirit saying, I'm going deeper so that you ha have an understanding of what I'm talking about, about the world's way. Remember, Jesus said, and we first said, when he said to the young lad, no one is good but one, which is God. At that moment, you can either say, how can he say that? Well, we're all trying to be good. He's not talking about you trying to be good. He's saying, there is no one good but one God. And then we start realizing through the scripture, wow. 
He was literally looking and we're learning what really good is. This is the most powerful good that you can stand on. The most powerful goodness of God. Moses has shown me thy glory. What did he say? You're not going to see it. You're going to see my goodness. You're going to see my manifested power, my manifested presence, and my manifested glory. Amen. So if Moses wanted to see his glory, God says, you're, you're not going to see that part. You're going to see who I am. I'm good. Think about we're living right now in that goodness. Let's stand up, church. Amen. Living in that goodness. Hallelujah. Amen. I want you right now to reach out with all your heart to the Lord. I want you to literally, uh, what you heard today by the Holy Ghost, say, Father, that's for me. You spoke to me. And there's all that you said today was for me, God. And I stand upon the rock of Jesus. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Father, who we are and who you are, you're a good God. And Father, thank you for showing us, as Jesus said, no one is good but one God. God, you are so pure, so perfect in your word. And yet, through Jesus' grace and mercy, we see what you mean by that. Father, we change our life to be more like you. We yield our presence to you, Lord. Whatever you say, Father, we yield to you, Lord. Father, speak to us. Father, your word says you'll never give us something that we cannot bear. You only give us that which you know we can understand. Baby steps, a step at a time, moving closer to you, Lord. Father, I thank you. I thank you for the anointing that's here today, that's touching every heart today, every person here. Thank you that the anointing of God is, is working deep within us. Thank you for the presence of the Lord here today. So, Father, we make you Lord of our life, Lord of our life, the Lord, owner, possessor, full authority over us in Jesus' wonderful name. Father, we thank you. We worship you. Oh, hallelujah. Worship you, Jesus. We worship you, Jesus. Oh, let's just worship him. Come on, church. Hallelujah. Just worship the Lord Jesus. Worship the Lord Jesus. Worship the Lord Jesus. We worship you, Lord. Worship you, Lord. We yield to you, Lord. We yield to you, Lord. Thank you, Father. We're yielding more into your presence, God. Thank you, Father. And Lord, we see why it's so important for us to move in this new direction and era that you're taking us through. Thank you, Father, that definitely John 11, 11 is coming to play. You're waking us up. You're waking this nation. You're waking this country. You're waking our leaders. You're waking us all, Father, for the better. And Jesus, as the revelator said, look up. For thy Redeemer draweth nigh. Jesus, you're coming soon, oh God. And we make ready. We prepare ourselves. We make ready. We fill our lamps with oil. Fill our lamps with oil of the Holy Ghost. We stay a burning, Lord Jesus. We don't let the oil go out. We stay a burning, Father. We, we burn in your presence, Father. We burn more for you, Jesus. We light up the world with your presence in us, God. Hallelujah. Father, the anointing increases in every one of us today. The anointing increasing. Oh, brashanda. In the name of Jesus, anointing increasing in everyone today. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, the anointing is increasing, Father. Do you want the anointing to increase in your life, ladies and gentlemen? Yes, we do. We want the anointing to increase in our life. In the name of Jesus, we give you praise. We give you praise. You know, Kenneth Hagin said, now listen to what he said, by the anointing. He said, get yourself on fire. Talk about the anointing. And others will come to watch you burn. When I heard that, I said, wow, that's powerful. Talk about the anointing. And notice this. Notice what, what this pastor said. He said this. The fire of the Holy Ghost will get so hot in the church 
that you will literally catch on fire with, not, not, excuse, not, you will by the anointing catch on fire the anointing. And those that want more of God will draw to it. And those that are being exposed that don't want the anointing will leave. And you know what that reminded me of? A campfire. I love, I used to love going hunting and camping in the wilderness and in the wintertime. And there was a time that all my buddies got together and we built a big old bonfire. We were cold and put that big bonfire. Man, it was wonderful. But the hotter that fire got, the more that we seen each other, every one of us kind of moving back a little. <laughs> moving back. It was getting too hot. You ever been close to a campfire that your pants are almost like they want to burn? So you back off. And then you keep putting wood in there because you can feel it at a certain distance. I said, the Lord said, it's like a campfire. You come to close. You're coming close to the fire of the Holy Ghost. Don't back out. Don't back out. Just stay with it. Stay with it. Stay with it. Amen. We give you praise, Jesus. We give you praise. We give you praise. We give you praise. Hallelujah. Amen. Give you praise. Hallelujah. Just catch on fire more. Hallelujah. Amen. Catch on fire more with God. Amen. Don't run from the fire. Run to the fire. Amen. Run to the fire. Let the Holy Ghost consume you with his presence. Hallelujah. Amen. And there'll be those that just uh, are wanting the blessing. They don't want the fire. They want the anointing. But it's got to be the fire. It's got to be the fire. Do you say amen? It's got to be the fire. It's got to be the fire. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Give God a worship. Come on. Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. Praise God.